My name is Tom Ward and I'm the Head of Content for Virtual Futures. And for those, who, and for those of you who are here for the first time, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about us before the main event gets underway. The first Virtual Futures conferences occurred at the University of Warwick during the mid-90s at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian put it, it's actually, hidden behind the brush steel and silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets and the techno parties, was much more sober and urgent. The aim, the animus, was to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st casting a critical eye on the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engaged and are engaging with the, with the emerging scientific theory and technological development. Events such as these have not wavered from this initial mission. So, let's begin. Virtual Futures, King's College London and Waterstones welcome you to an evening of science fiction and discuss discussion as we explore the following statement. By imagining possible futures, Near future fiction has the capacity to seize on the science and technology currently researched in laboratory environments and take it just far enough that it can provoke audiences to think about the impending potential implications it has for society. As I'm just the pretty face for virtual futures, I'd now like to introduce Stephen Oram, who will be hosting this evening. Stephen writes science fiction, often in collaboration with scientists, and is lead curator for Near Future Fiction at Virtual Futures. He's been a hippie punk, religious squatter, and an anarchist <coughs> bureaucrat. He has published in several anthologies, has two published novels, Quantum Confessions, and Fluence. His collection of sci-fi stories, Eating Robots and Other Stories, was described by the Morning Star as one of the top radical works of fiction in 2017. Thanks very much for putting up with my spiel, and over to you, Stephen. Okay, good evening. Am I, am I coming through? Okay. Yeah? yeah? Okay, so as Tom said, I'm not the pretty face of the virtual futures, <laughs> uh, the unpretty face, possibly. Um, and I, I just need to read a little bit about what this event's about, mainly because there's certain things we need to say about it because of certain people that have helped it happen, and I want to make sure I get it right. So I'm going to do that and then tell you a little bit about how it's going to work, and then we'll get, we'll get into it. So this event uh, is part of a project called Transforming Future Science Through Science Fiction, which is being run by Dr. Christine Accardi, Science and Technology Studies Researcher at King's College London. Yay. This is Christine. Yay. And you can grab her and ask her all sorts of questions afterwards if you want. Uh, and I've been working on that project in, in collaboration uh, with Christy. Um, the project has seen so science fiction authors basically collaborating with scientists at King's College to adapt their cutting edge research into short stories, and that's what you'll hear some of tonight. And the project is supported by the Cultural Institute at King's College London and the Human Brain Project under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. So, but I've mentioned everyone I need to mention. Yep, excellent, <laughs> okay. Right. So that's, but, you know, that, that's, uh, it's been great to be part of that, and it, it, there is a real thank you to those people. So the way, the way this is going to work, um, we've got three stories that have come out of this collaboration. You're going to hear all three. Uh, we'll have a, a story will be read, and then one of the panellists will respond to the story and the sort of slightly wider theme of science and science fiction. Then we'll move on to another story response, story response. Then there'll be a bit of a panel discussion, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers from you guys. And then there'll be an opportunity, as long as we're not running over, to get a drink, talk to somebody, talk to one of us, have a look at this books over there uh, of uh, these good people's work. So that's that's the basic uh, way that's going to that's going to happen. Just sort of a minute or so, just to unpack where this project has come from. So it first started out with a visit to Bristol Robotics Lab with uh, Christine and the Human Brain Project. 
and three authors, I was one of them, um, we wrote three stories for the Bristol Literature Festival. That went very well, and therefore we then went into the next stage, which was to work with labs at King's College London, uh, where I learned terms like Evo Devo, which I'd never heard of before. I don't think people heard of Evo Devo. <laughs> Evolutionary development, for those of you there. And a geriatric cognitions lab. Uh, so that was then that's where these stories have, have come from. And I think through that, I, I felt a lot of the time sort of hanging on by my intellectual fingertips, uh, sort of almost understanding uh, what's going on, but certainly better than trying to read it in the news or academic papers or, or, or whatever. You know. Being there, seeing it, talking to people uh, makes a huge difference. So in those visits to King's College, obviously I was one, uh, Jeff was one, and Pippa, who sadly can't be with us because in Germany, uh, was one as well. And as I say, we wrote some stories which you're going to hear tonight. But also, on the panel, we have a lot of experience and knowledge around this science, science fiction collaboration. So that will come out through the conversation, but also if you're paying attention and hear the stories and hear what's said, you can um, ask some good questions as well. So you can help unpack what you want to, un what you want to unpack. The other slight sad news, it's not really, really sad in Sorry, I'm now down a rabbit hole that uh, I can't get out of. Um, basically, uh, so Simon Ings, who is going to be here, is stuck in Switzerland, exactly. So he, he can't make it. So there we are. So let's move on to the, the sort of content of the evening. Um, what I'll do as I go along, I'll introduce the person who's going to read and the person who's going to respond. So I will introduce the panel as we sort of go through. So the first person who's going to read their story is Jeff. Ryman, who's sitting at the other end uh, of this uh, set of lovely people from me. Um, Jeff has won the Nebula Award, the Arthur C. Clarke Award twice, the British Science Fiction Association Award three times, and 11 other science fiction or fantasy awards. He was the commissioning editor of When It Changed, which is an anthology of commissioned collaborations between scientists and writers. And currently, he is publishing a series of interviews on Strange Horizons uh, called 100 African Writers of Sci-Fi and Fantasy. Uh, in a moment, Jeff is going to read his story, which is called Not Best Pleased. But let me just introduce the person who's going to respond to that. So Ken McLeod, who's sitting next to him, is the author of 17 novels, from The Star Fraction to The Corporation Wars, and many articles and short stories. His novels and stories have received three BSFA awards and three Prometheus awards, and several have been shortlisted for the Clark and Hugo awards. In 2009, he was the writer in residence at the ESRC Genomics Policy and Research Forum at Edinburgh University, and was guest selector for the science fiction strand at the Edinburgh International Book Festival in 2017. So, Jeff will read Not Best Pleased, and then uh, Ken will say what he wants. Please be kind. Hey, the mic is on as well. It, uh, at least I'm not in the bathroom and not realizing I'm wired for sound. Okay. I'll do this one. Hello? Just keeping it. Oh, that's better. Okay. Um, that's better. Where's the button? It's off. That's all right. Okay, you'll have to forgive my Dick Van Dyke routine, um, but this person who is speaking is nothing like me. She's not like me at all, so I'll do my Dick Van Dyke routine and imagine through my performance to who she might be. The story is called Not Best Pleased. I'm not best pleased. Todd used to be an interesting student, full of ideas and very nice to talk to, but sloppy. <laughs> Typical male, coffee mug marks on countertops, a vial left out open and the slides not done. Pretty apologies. He's like, oh, I'm sorry, Edwina, I put them away. Please don't, Todd. It, it, it's all right, I know where it needs to go. Me, easing it out of his hand. I'm not sure you do. It's been left out next to your son, is that'll attract other flies. A queasy smile from him. 
that in my foolishness I thought might be embarrassment for this poor work. He asks me, what are you going to do with my colonies? Oh, I'll keep them warm and feed them and hope they're okay. He looks hesitant. I don't have a long tether. He asks me again what I'm going to do with them. And I say, you mean you haven't worked on them yet? You left the vial open, but you didn't make your slides. Check me watch, because it's nearly lunchtime. Nearly lunchtime. Nothing to say for himself. <laughs> Go on, Todd, finish your lunch and make your slides, but not with these, all right? He said something very strange. It won't be mine. Todd's working on our zombie fruit flies. The newspapers love them. You colour their heads because so much of their nervous system is located on the ventral. They continue to live, groom themselves, react to heat for hours. Like our politicians. It can take you a second or two to notice that they're missing their heads. Sometimes healthy males try to mate with them. Like our MPs who ask their secretaries to buy them dildos. We phosphoresced particular neurons to see what roles the nerve cells might play in this. We're also trying to breed a new strain of fruit flies that survive longer once they're decapitated. More to study. The plan was to fund our politician-styled research by breeding enough of the new strain to sell them to other labs. You can imagine, can't you? Get two packs of zombie fruit flies for the price of one. Just in time for Easter, you too can come back from the dead. Come to think, hmm. The breeding the new strain was Todd's idea. Two hours after a team meeting that I thought was an informal discussion, you know, out of the box blue sky thinking. Two hours later, boom, a detailed proposal bang on my desk. So I thought, more fool me. I've been manipulated. That one's a bit pushy, I thought. But yeah. We started to select not just for constant unambiguous results or for survival robustness, but for fertility. We started breeding the buggers. What could go wrong, eh? Anyway, a week goes by after the great Sarni catastrophe. I think nothing more of it. Todd takes a day off, sick. Same day, Yukio tells me, I should come and see something. She holds up a vial, a colony. Now, fruit flies are what you call negatively geostatic. They will always climb upwards, but they're individualists. I think of them as the yuppies of the insect world. But these fruit flies had ranged themselves in rows, from low down to the top, all lined up. And the rows were in spirals and parallel. They looked like corn-rowed hair on a supermodel. I held up the multifocals curve so I could see better. At first glance, you'd think they'd got their heads. But these heads look lopsided and white. So I'm like, <laughs> this is one of Todd's colonies, right? Yukio said now, face shut tight as a microwave. She's not one to shop anybody, that girl. Uh, put one of under the microscope, let's see. We do see. Where it should have a head, it's got something gray lopsided, swollen. It looks like a mushroom. <laughs> what on earth? Yukio hesitates. I think it's decapitated. Then grew something like a head. <laughs> grew some new behaviors and all. What's it doing putting decapitated flies back in the vials? I look again. Headless fly with a mushroom head stuffed full of white stuff. Basically it's goop held together by the insect shell. But it's still marched in formation up the side of the vial. Eh, that's fungi. Yeah, that'll be the fungi they're studying downstairs in Jason's team. <laughs> Jason's project, two floors down in a clean lab. Locked doors, face mask, foot baths are locked. Don't ask me how he gets the funding. They're studying Entomorphora muscae. It's a fungus that takes over normal fruit fly activity. The infected animal's fine for a week, then starts to behave erratically. The fungus takes over its autonomous nervous system, 
So the fly fixes itself to a wall with its proboscis, and it becomes a fungal colony. When it bursts, it releases spores at nine meters per second. To try some, Jason has to film at 54,000 frames a minute. Yukio, please, tell me we haven't let any of those out. None of these mushroom-headed flies, because uh, they could destroy our whole program. Yukio's hands are twisting. Their bodies are bigger, too. Elevated wings. I get what she means. Those are sexual signals. Males will try to mate with them. Any males who do are likely to be infected. We're a low-tech lab. We pride ourselves on it with our funding, prides what we've got left. We separate different populations with painter's brushes. We call it fly pushing. We'll have to burn all those brushes now. Christ in a handbasket. <laughs> we'll have to decaminate the whole lab. Okay, Yukio, please. Photograph that sample, photograph the colony, document it, document it, then bin the lot. Bin all the vials, don't even try to keep them. All our bags get first frozen, and then they get incinerated. I give Todd a call. Todd, I'm sorry to trouble you while you're sick, but at least one of your colonies is badly contaminated. Oh no, yeah, oh no. With the fungus that Jason team has been working with. Did you visit the second floor? Did they visit us? Do you know any of Jason's team? Silence. So I push on. And they've been decapped and left in a breeding vial. So how did that happen, Todd? What's it all about? His breath rattles down the phone. What are you going to do with the colonies? Ooh. Colonies, plural. He asks me, tell me, how are they behaving? Oh, well, that triggers me alarm bells. I don't want any nonsense over discovery this, discovery that. I lie. I tell them the flies just fell over and died. They look like autumn leaves all over their yeast feed. Maybe he knows different. He says, really? Not a question. Yeah, really. They're all dead, and getting them contaminated with fungus was a good way to do it. I'm on my way over. Todd, if you're sick, I'd rather you stayed at home. Thank you for your concern. I talked to the team. We do decide to incinerate all our flies and autoclave anything else that can be autoclaved. Then we'll call in a professional lab clean. I go downstairs to reception to intercept Todd. We have contract front door staff who have many other jobs. More cost cutting. Todd comes spinning in through our always open revolving door. Ooh, it's 24 seven round here. His skin is beige gray and he's shivering. Hello, Todd, come to give us your lurgy. Edwina, what have you done to my samples? Whew. His breath stinks like raw onions, rotten fish in my compost bucket. I destroyed him. And the lab's closed so it can be clean, so you might as well go home. He sits down. He has to sit down. He crumples up like an old five-pound note. You're not well, Todd. He throws off my hand. Don't patronize me. Oh, I'm not patronizing you. I'm firing you. Go contaminate someone else's lab. He looks at me through a fog of illness. But you'll publish the results. I see something like... Thick yogurt in the corners of his mouth. It's beige gray. That'll be the stink. For some reason, I remember this article I saw in Nature about a cat parasite. It makes male rats very bold and attracted to cat's pee. That gets them eaten by cats and that spreads the parasite. People carry it without any sign of illness, but it makes you bolder. There's a huge correlation between being infected and driving in a motorcycle. I have the nastiest thought. Todd, by any chance you wouldn't have a fungal infection?
So, Ken, do you want to well, follow that? <laughs> eh? Yeah, I think I think after after that Nature article came out and then it disseminated more widely through New Scientist, there was a sort of shudder of recognition through science fiction fandom, as everybody who had a cat looked at each other and thought, "Hmm, ah, yes, now it all makes sense." Um, the The story I really like. It is, it is, the, it is exactly the, the thing of taking some realistic current science and putting it forward a little bit. And I think any scientist will be familiar with the, um, the sort of life finds a way logic of these um, organisms that multiply in ways and in places that you don't expect them to. The most current example of that that I can think of, i.e. something I only learned about last week, is that we have managed to breed microbes, that bacteria, that can live on the cleaning fluid that is used to clean interplanetary probes. So, <laughs> you know, at what point does, do we have to give up the search for alien life because we're busy creating alien life? And <clears throat> on the the specific, you know, and, and I, I, I did, I should say, I, I liked the way in which the um, literary aspects of the story, your, your uh, characters and so on, did carry a lot more weight than would be, would be done in a kind of normal science fiction cautionary fable. Um, on, the, on the point about near, near future science and science fiction and helping us to understand what's about to come out of the labs. I think, you know, both Jeff and I have got a, f a wee bit of, <laughs> a, we're kind of old lags in this area. <laughs> and I think that writing near future science fiction is the most difficult, especially in getting the, the technology right. I, I have written, um, 17 novels, as, as was said, and when I look back at the old, older ones, the earlier ones, I'm amazed at how many near future developments I completely got wrong. <laughs> you know, we were really good at that. Near, near future SF is, is, is highly risky, and it's, it's, it's often very hard to see the consequences of something that's in, in the labs. I think one of the ways in which science fiction can help is when it becomes conscious and itself reflexive of what it's doing. Because part of um, what science fiction does, I think, in a, in a general sense, is it participates in the hype cycle of technologies, even if it's not aware of it. So that the a couple of very classic and obvious examples, and I don't want to get into anything terribly arcane, so forgive me if you've heard these ones before and it seems so obvious, but when science fiction was writing about spaceships, um, everybody was, you know, aviation was transforming the world. And when actual spacecraft came along, the science fiction itself became somewhat outdated and had to find other things to write about. When computers were just beginning to transform the workplace. Science fiction had discovered cyberpunk and was thinking of a, a networked world. And that was a case in which the hype cycle and the actual development of technology and the science fiction, for one glorious awful moment in the early 90s, seemed to be running along in a, a positive feedback loop. And I think what we have to do in looking at near future SF, and as Stephen said, it is immensely stimulating to look at the actual work being done in the labs and trying to project beyond it. But to wrap up, I think there are two, the, the two difficulties are, which we have to consciously grapple with, are stepping beyond even what the scientists imagine and the technologists imagine can be done with it and looking at the secondary and tertiary and so on consequences. As Isaac Asimov once said, anybody could imagine the automobile, but it's 
what the science fiction writer has to do is the equivalent of trying to imagine or predict talk radio. Because if there are lots of automobiles, people will be stuck in traffic jams. And what are they going to be doing in traffic jams? They're going to be listening to the radio, right? So if you're working as a science fiction writer, that's the kind of level of... And you have to do that, um, finally, to, without getting caught up in this hype cycle and the whole political economy of hyping a new tech. Thank you. So hold on to a lot of that because we'll come back to some of that and you can ask questions on that, but that's great, thank you, yeah. Okay, so we have our next story, uh, which was written by Pippa Goldschmidt, who, as I said, can't be here. Um, it's going to be read by Gigi, who's a very talented reader amongst lots of other things. I'll just tell you a little bit about Pippa um, so, so, you, so you know. And then um, Jennifer, and I'll tell you a bit about Jennifer in a minute, is going to respond to it. So Pippa uh, enjoys writing fiction about science. She's the author of the novel The Falling Sky and the short story collection The Need for Better Regulation of Outer Space. In 2016, she was a winner of the MRC Suffrage Science Award and her poem, Physics for the Unwary Students, was chosen to be one of the Scottish Poetry Library's best Scottish poems. So we have, we have quite a Scottish representation <laughs> here this evening, as you're probably gathering. Um, however, Jennifer isn't Scottish. So Jennifer Bruin uh, is a practicing scientist as well as a novelist, journalist, public speaker, science communicator and pundit. She coined the term lablet to describe realistic novels featuring scientists as central characters. She founded the popular website lablet.com, you should check it out, to help promote the use of science and scientist characters in mainstream fiction and to illuminate the world of scientists and laboratory culture. Her writing has appeared in many places, including The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Times, BBC News, Nature, and The Scientist. So Jennifer will respond to Pippa's story. And uh, I asked Gigi what she wanted to be said about herself. She said, just my name. So this is, <laughs> this is the incredibly talented Gigi, who will be reading Inside the Lock Cupboard. In a laboratory, death is so unremarkable nobody thinks of it as death at all. An uncounted number of deaths happen each and every day here, but even so, I rely on precision. It's my guiding principle. Each of my staff must carry out the same experiment to show they can achieve the same result. A lab worker must be judged by how universal they are. They must be able to demonstrate that there is nothing special about their results, and they must be able to reproduce those results in the same way some organisms can clone themselves. So my staff take it in turns in the fly room, one by one, to carry out my chosen experiment while I stand outside and watch them through the window. I was hired for this post to replace a man who was secretly addicted to the world's flesh through a net of pixels, who claimed, when caught by that net, that he only looked and never touched. Consequently, everything we do here is very open. In this lab, everything will be observed. I have devised a choreography for the human fly padder. Select a fly, position it on the panel, observe it through the microscope, and dispose of it in the conical flask. But today, as I watch one of my staff in the fly room, she looks up and stares straight back at me. This uncalled for improvisation, it isn't part of my experiment's design. And I can't see the individual flies drowning in the flask, not from the other side of the window. A CCTV camera installed in the fly room would record more than I can. I'll order one to be installed. A laboratory eats money. To keep it going, fists of banknotes must be constantly fed into the equipment, into the fridges, fume cupboards, centrifuges and gene sequencers. It's my responsibility to make sure that this happens. Therefore, I write grant applications and I make promises and I give a shape to our future. My office is at the end of the corridor, a long way from the fly room. Nobody comes up here. Even so, the door to my office must always remain open. That's one of the conditions of my appointment. And I argued to this because, of course, I have nothing to hide. Here I sit with my laptop in this almost empty room. All I have are a desk, an upright chair and a cupboard. 
No easy chairs or rugs or waste paper baskets. I have no need for any of those items. The cupboard is not much use. Its doors are locked and I have no key, so I ask my admin assistant to arrange for its quick disposal. Open shelves are better anyway. Unfortunately, the largest and most ambitious of my grant applications has been turned down. When I inform the rest of the lab at our weekly meeting, their eyes widen. I remind them that there are plenty of other grants that I am applying for and they can rely on me to support them. Then I mention the installation of the CCTV cameras and their eyes widen again. It's time to end the meeting. Afterwards, I go to the fly room and I stand and I watch through the window. As before, the postdoc working in there looks up from what she's doing with a microscope and, and she just looks at me. She doesn't drop her gaze until I walk off. I find this odd because I know why I am watching her but why is she watching me? What does she see? When I reach my office, the admin assistant tells me the cupboard can't be removed because officially it doesn't exist. There's no record of it in the university assets register. And when I sit at my desk looking over my staff's lab books, I see that each one of my staff is achieving exactly the same result in the experiment. There is no statistical deviation at all. That is not scientifically possible. They must be faking the results, and yet when I check their observations, I can't really see how. Nothing appears altered or erased or rewritten. Ten people work here, and when they sit side by side in our weekly meetings, I can tell them apart, but not elsewhere. Later that same day, I'm in my office, writing another grant application, when I look up. Just beyond the open door, I glimpse someone standing in the corridor. One of my workers, I can tell this by the white coat, even though I can't see her face. I return to my work. They all depend on me, and I'm very aware of that. <clears throat> the university has insisted that no files must ever be deleted from our computers. Consequently, data storage is beginning to be a pretty big problem, and all the code is running slower and slower. It takes me a long time to complete an online form asking for more money. Later that evening, I remove my glasses to rub my eyes, and I notice that the cupboard door has swung open, revealing darkness inside. The cupboard must have done this of its own accord, so I approach it and kneel in front of it. Again, I feel someone's eyes on me, but when I look up, the corridor seems to be empty. Inside the cupboard are rows of box files. Each one has a label attached to its spine, but the writing on these labels is too small for it to be legible. The box files are all identical, so I choose one at random and inch it away from its twins. It weighs less than it should do if there were papers inside. Perhaps it is empty, but when I shake it, I can hear something rustling inside, like fallen leaves. I place the box file on the edge of my desk and return to my laptop. Every keystroke I make is recorded, even the ones I subsequently delete. There can be no true deletions here. The university has made sure to see to that. A member of my staff is always present, night and day, to tend to the flies. But tonight, I can't hear anyone else. When I finally decide to open the lid of the box file, the building is utterly silent. The lid falls back, and the box reveals its secrets. Inside, it's not what I was expecting. There are no piles of yellowed journal articles or old exam scripts. Inside this box are corpses an uncountable number of dead bodies. The box is full of them. They must have been accumulated over many experiments over a very long period of time, but why were they not disposed of in the usual manner? I go over to the cupboard, which I estimate holds 20 more box files, and now I see in the corner of the cupboard that there is space, space for future box files and their planned occupants. I try and shut the door to the cupboard, but it refuses to shut. It just insists on hanging open. And when I retreat from the cupboard and return to my desk, I accidentally jolt the open box file and it falls off so that the dead bodies cascade down and a great shining heap of them forms on the carpet. And I have no waste paper basket and no way of disposing them. I really want to shut my office door. I really want some privacy here, but this is forbidden. I wish I could hide what I've done, but the door must always remain open. That is the rule and everyone must follow the rules here, especially me. All I can do is use a piece of paper to try and shovel them back into the box, but this is a very inefficient progress process, <laughs> and it takes a long time. 
Some of the corpses have caught in the carpet and I'm forced to pick these ones up with my fingers. An individual dead body weighs nothing. I can hardly feel it. And for some reason, that makes it a lot worse. In the inadequate evening light at the office of the office, I will not be able to see all the remaining bodies and it's inevitable that a few of them will evade my attempts to hide them away again. Why are the bodies stored here in this room? I feel as if I've exposed a secret, but I can't really guess what that secret is. Did my predecessor do this? I had assumed he only looked at images. Consequently, I had pictured him being removed from here quickly and efficiently, just the way you'd ordinarily let the subject of your experiment fall into its flask of clear liquid with no thought before moving on to the next one. Or was it the people still working here? My staff, who even now might all be standing outside this office in the dark corridor, watching me as I try and fail to pick up the flies. Thank you. So, Jennifer, do you want to respond? This is a very interesting story in that, although it could have happened procedurally, it could have happened at any time in the past 50 years. It's deeply dystopian, I feel, and it's in the, in the, the, the you, you all felt it, the sort of black strangeness of the story. And I think it's especially disturbing to me as a practicing science, scientist today, because I can see hints of that world already in my own laboratory. I'm not like that person. I don't have CCTV. I don't, I don't watch my staff. Uh, and modern day laboratories are very, they tend to be very friendly places and the lab head is, tends to be um, a colleague, uh, not in this world where they are more like a keeper. But I, I have seen in, in my years that we are slowly, if you like, increasing a transparency, uh, encouraged to be open, encouraged to be reproducible, encouraged to keep everything on file. But this is, is meant to be a good thing and it's meant to help science, but I can easily see how it could go too far. I can see how the universities try, will try to cover their backs. There's increasing amounts of fraud in real life and science. I think there's always been a fraud, but I think we're getting better at catching it. So people are worried about fraud, they're worried about accountability, they're worried about reproducibility. There's a lot of pressure on scientists these days because there is no funding as the story adequately noted, adequately, uh, aptly noted, uh, we spend all of our time just trying to find money and less time doing science. That's all I do these days is to write grants and then write the papers that will attract the grants. And, and in my mind this isn't science and I feel that it's been going this way for many years and it's getting worse and worse. Uh, the less money there is for science, the more there's the pressure. And then when there's pressure, the more people are tempted into things like fraud because you just need that paper to get that grant. And to get that paper, you might just need a few extra experiments that you didn't actually do, or maybe a slightly nicer result than you actually got in order to get into the big journal that will give you the big grant. So we have this pressure cooker situation. We have dwindling funds, increasing pressure, um, increasing pressure to be accountable. And I can well imagine that one day you might end up with laboratories where instead of hiring a, a scientist as a lab head, you might hire a zookeeper <laughs> to, or, a, or a minder to look after the science and make sure that everything is done perfectly. Um, I don't understand actually what Pippa was trying to do with, with the dead flies in the boxes. It was a very nightmarish uh, sort of dystopian feel. I, I'm not sure. I'd like to discuss it in the Q&A. It would be great to hear what people's idea about what metaphor those dead flies is actually fulfilling for the story. But as far as being a tale, a dystopian tale of near future, it kind of is. It, interestingly, there was no science in this story. There were no ideas. We didn't hear about fungus or cloning or anything. It was all about the process of science. And I'm very interested in how scientists and the process of science is depicted in fiction. And, and I know Pippa is as well. So I, I was a little bit disturbed by her vision. And I'm very interested to hear what later what people think about it. OK, thank you. So yes, not, not a world that you would look forward to particularly. Um, so uh, as I said before, keep, that, keep those thoughts in, in your head uh, to ask 
ask the questions later on. Um, this is the strange part where I sort of introduce myself. Um, so I'm going to read the story that I wrote <laughs> uh, and Jeff is going to respond to it. So I don't need to do any uh, more introductions. Um, so pretends that it's not quite the same person and I shall walk over here um, and read you the story that I wrote uh, as a result of visiting the uh, geriatric cognition project which also houses the twins project which is fascinating if you um, don't know it I suggest you look it up so am I on good mic yeah okay so this story is called Zygosity Saves the Day. Will she recognize us? Oh, Isabella, I don't know. I hope she does. I'm not sure how I'll cope if she's in a state again. She's your mother. You'll cope. The two women made their way through the snow, carefully avoiding the slush and the ice, and whenever they reached a particularly hazardous spot, Lara grabbed her niece's arm for support. They stopped at the tall iron gates to the grounds of the ancient building, and Isabella smiled as the camera swung around to face them. She nudged her aunt. Smile, she said. Isabella felt Lara stiffen. It's okay, auntie. It's only facial recognition. It's nothing sinister. I know, said Lara. I'm not used to these public health facilities. Things are more subtle in my private one. The snow was fresh and crisp and the crunch underfoot was a welcome distraction from the ordeal ahead. With the wind blowing across the fields and through the trees causing a loud rustling like a stream running over rocks, they left a trail of footprints behind them as they walked along the track to the old house. A large clump of snow fell from a branch onto the path in front of them, and they both faltered briefly before continuing. Isabella broke the comfortable silence. Why her? Why did she end up like this? Because, just because, said Lara quietly. Isabella was angry and didn't hide it. I'm sorry, but I don't buy that. You're twins. You're identical. Shrugging your shoulders isn't good enough. Look at you, you're okay. There must be a reason. It'll happen to me too. Everything she gets, I get, eventually. It's simply timing then. Is that what you're saying? Yes, pretty much. Up ahead, the path was blocked by another set of iron gates with a DNA machine on either side. One for the security bots to check you in, and one to check you out. There was no freedom for the old and infirm. After all, as the mantra went, it was bad enough that the public purse had to pay for your care, let alone the cost of having you wandering around creating extra work for the police, and reminding the fit and healthy of what they might become. Such insensitivity was discouraged and the insurance companies provided safe, walled-in communities. That's what you wanted, so why should the taxpayer pay for them too? Aunt and niece stood huddled together, waiting for the DNA results to confirm their facial identity. Five minutes might not be long for their self-swab buds to be tested, but in the freezing cold, while waiting to do something that you really didn't want to do, it seemed like a lifetime. Once again, Isabella broke the silence. So you'll end up here too, will you? No, I have insurance. There'll be a health solution for me. Platinum if I can retain my current frailty index rating. But she's your twin, it's not fair. Twin, how I hate that word. Do you know how old I was before I heard anyone use my name? Twin this, twin that, the twins. Oh, how I remember hearing my mother's friend calling me Lara. Mrs. Pierce, I think her name was. Wonderful, beautiful woman. She understood. The light on the DNA machine turned green and the old iron gates creaked open. Come on, said Lara. Let's go see her. 
Inside the gates, a narrow channel through the snow had been cleared to the front door. There wasn't quite enough room to walk side by side, so they shuffled along awkwardly, knocking the snow piled up along the edge of the channel as they went. Flaking blue paint revealed the worn wood of the front door. Much like its inhabitants, the building had seen better days, and, much like its inhabitants, it had been left to fall apart when it could have been saved. An all-weather screen attached to the wall announced holistic, ho holistic hospital services. Its shiny technology making the ageing door look even more tired and decrepit. Lara spat on the floor. Holistic. At the age of 70. Too little, too bloody late. Isabella smiled at the screen and the display changed to Mother, Beatrice Silva, room 343. The door opened and a bot indicated that they should take the eastern corridor, which was lined with tiny rooms converted from the large rooms of the old house. Halfway along the ground floor corridor was a staircase spiralling down into the cellar, which housed an old-fashioned virtual reality studio. The headgear and bodysuit still hung on a coat rack gathering dust, except for a few that the more adventurous residents used to either escape or stimulate their lives depending on your viewpoint. A room of fake friends. Typical, said Lara, and shuddered. The steel-shuttered lift at the end of the corridor stood open, and a two-foot-tall bot beckoned them to make use of its service. Lara nodded toward it. Shall we? Isabella linked her arm through her aunt's. Why the hell didn't she get insurance? she asked. Stupid woman didn't think it was the right time for an assessment. When was that? In our late forties, there was an open invitation from private health companies. The Holistic Health Check, it was called. It tested for every conceivable health problem you might face. If you took it and acted upon it, insurance was available. Keep your cognition, was the slogan. Why was that the slogan? They found some reliable biomarkers they could use to predict cognitive change in old age. By studying twins, of all things. And don't tell me, you took part and she refused? Yes, I took part. They gave me a 25-year 25 25-year 25 health plan. I even had my own personalised medication. That sister of mine scoffed, but I took it seriously because most of that cognitive, cognitive change is not pleasant. Isabella put her arm through her auntie's around her auntie's shoulders. True, look at mum, she said. They tailored my plan, you know, at the beginning of each year, and each time I tried to get her to copy me. She didn't? No, not at all. Refused. Should have insisted. She wasn't ready to listen. Lara grabbed Isabella's arm tighter as the rickety old lift shuddered to a halt on the third floor. Another bot was waiting for them, and as they stepped out it glided along the corridor in the direction of room 343. Arm in arm, they followed. The bot opened the door to the room and returned to the lift. Cautiously, they stepped inside and registered with yet another bot authorising entries and exits. It scanned their faces and slid back into the corner. Beatrice, mum and sister, lay there passively while a room full of medical bots attended to her needs. A white bot, with a blue cross on its back, was asking her to count down in twos from 20 to zero while it clicked loudly. She kept trying and failing, getting distracted and asking over and over again, Where's Vince? Where's Vince? Shit, that'll be me someday if I don't die of something else first, said Lara. Me too, said Isabella. Not necessarily. She's my mirror. Only half of you is from her. You can't claim her like that. Zygosity says I can. Isabella sat down on the edge of the bed and sighed loudly. Twins, she said under her breath. Always the trump card. The medical bots finished their work and left the room. Only the guard bot remained. Lara rolled her sister over onto her side. Help me, she said, glancing at the bot. I need to be exactly where she was. They need to think I'm her. She stripped, climbed onto the bed and lay next to her sister. Peas in a pod, 
she said. Auntie, what are you doing? Help her out of bed. What's going on? Do it. Isabella knelt by the bed and helped her mother stand up. Laura shifted sideways until she was perfectly positioned. There, she said. I'm her. They'll never know. Now what? asked Isabella. Now you take her to my insurance facility and they'll treat her properly. Give her human contact and treatment based on reliable data. And you? I'll make a remarkable recovery and they'll have to release me. The guard bots scanned their faces and the door opened. Isabella glanced back at her aunt. Laura's tears glistened in the glow of the medical lighting as the door closed shut. hope I don't explode. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, that's a classic short story, isn't it? Um, the brief was to keep things within a certain reading time, and that meant to a certain number of words. So it's very interesting how that story just about happens in real time. Um, and it's also, uh, it's really quite, in that limited amount of time, the challenge of writing that story is to release all the information you need, not only to get the little twist ending, and not to get the twist ending too soon, so that when you get the twist ending, you go, oh, of course. Um, it's also to, in a very brief period of time, show us that world. And there's quite a lot to talk about in that world. It's a world of big data. They have huge studies into uh, genomes and then how they show up in the real world. They'll have a huge amount of data on stuff like lifestyle, pollution, and some advanced medications as well. Preventative medicine really works, but it's a world of overpopulation. It's a world rather like ours, which huge numbers of useless old people. And uh, so it's also uh, a discourse on social inequality. Uh, when Stephen wrote the story, I don't think people had yet seriously proposed to staff the NHS with robots but they have seriously proposed it now as a cost-cutting measure, and that's really at the heart of the story. Um, so it's got a lot of social themes. Uh, the, the other, in case you think, uh, that there's a marvelous bit where they have nothing to do and they're waiting to get in. Um, so one of the things that Stephen does very well about releasing information in a science fiction story is if your characters are doing nothing and they're waiting, that's when you can get in a little bit of an info dump, particularly if it's what they're likely to be thinking. And in that very brief section, he just sketches very lightly, very lightly indeed, the kind of world we're in. Um, it's only, I think, in the 1960s that some United States uh, uh, rescinded what were called ugly laws, that basically there was legislation that said it was you could be uh, charged if you caused offense or difficulty or um, disgusted people by openly parading people who were likely to cause disgust. That means disabled people, simple people, people who are horribly disfigured. It might actually be an offense to show them on a street. And we've seen Lots of old people in this story, lots of them shut away, and it's slightly offensive. It's not very sensitive at all to display them. So they're being shut away. Uh, and not at all an uh, uh, impossible kind of uh, handmaid's tale, slight touch of dystopianism there that I could quite go along with. All the time he's filling you in with little bits of technological detail that keep you slightly distracted. It's facial uh, recognition at first, but oh, it's also DNA to confirm it. Um, an awful lot of description of the environment that's not at all relevant, really. It just makes that world real, the snow falling from the tree, the description of the door. So it's quite centrally rich. The other thing that Stephen knows, in his, uh, I'm sure he just writes this instinctively, is that, uh, that information is a weapon. That people do not naturally say, as they do in bad movies, 
As you know, Bob, we've been married for 15 years. And as you know, though I once found you very attractive, I now wish you'd use deodorant. And as you know, we have invented wormholes. Let me explain to you the scientists who helped me develop them as they did in Interstellar. Matthew McConaughey recognizes a wormhole from a photograph, and three scenes later, the scientist is busy sticking a pen through two folded pieces of paper to explain to this character. Yeah, blah, blah. So it's very interesting. Uh, Isabella is attacking Lara at first. She's angry. And the information that Isabella releases in that paragraph is information as weapon. It's information as, okay, this is what happened. Now leave me alone. The second uh, info dump, Lara is much more wanting to find out. Well, okay, so what happened then? How come you ended up with the expensive insurance and she didn't? And at that stage, it's a different kind of request. Laura's actually holding out an olive branch. And there's a different kind of interaction going on. But there's a real need for that information, something Isabella doesn't know. Uh, I also quite like the flash of anger that um, Isabella shows, the twins. Because without underlining it all, without telling us, he's showing us really why one sister dug her heels in and didn't go for the effective and scientifically based preventative healthcare treatment. She didn't want to do what her sister was doing. So it's, it's all very neatly packaged in this incredibly tight brief. How many words was it, Stephen? Uh, yeah, it's under 2,000. Yeah, under 2,000 words. That's really quite difficult to do. So uh, yeah, and, and to tie it all up with a lovely little ribbon. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, it would work. So anyway, that, that's my take on it. And in terms of the science, uh, I don't think there's anything in that story that none of us here don't kind of know. Um, I think that's one of the features of a near... Well, it used to be the future, uh, feature of all science fiction. It used to be that science fiction was defined who by? Was it Bob Shaw? You know, a fiction that speculates with science that's known by any educated 12-year-old. Um, well, real science and real science fiction these days, probably only 40 people on the planet actually understand it, quantum mechanics and astrophysics. But uh, with speculative realism, as it's sometimes called, uh, you, you get, you're back in that situation where you're working with stuff we all know and understand, but you're shuffling the cards to show us potential. And I think some of this is definitely on the cards. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> hopefully not all of it. Okay, so we've now got uh, a little bit of a sort of panel discussion, although you've obviously heard from, from, the, from the panel as well. So we'll do that and uh, get, make sure we've got some time for Q&A. So if you see me looking at my watch, it's not because I think uh, we're all bored or anything, it's just I'm making sure that you get enough time for the, for the Q&A. So we've probably got around about 20 minutes or so of a panel discussion. Um, so, uh, I'm going to sort of unpack uh, some of the things we've, we've, been, we've been talking about and take them a little bit further. I'm just going to remind you of the, of the quote that Tom uh, read at the beginning around what this is about. So, by imagining possible futures, near future fiction has the capacity to seize on the science and technology currently researched in laboratory environments and take it just far enough that it can provoke audiences to think on impending potential implications for society. So that was the, the quote. And what, obviously what we're doing here is thinking about that interaction between science and science fiction, and we're going to look at that in, in, in two or three ways. So um, I, one of the things that's really struck me working with scientists, and this is really, really obvious, but they're humans, um, which means that they, you know, they're absolutely fabulous in the way that humans are, and, and obviously they're flawed in the way that humans are as well. That might seem like a very obvious thing to say, um, but that's one of the things that's really struck me. And Obviously, it goes with the territory. You're a scientist, so you are reflexive. You are reflecting on, on, on things. But, Ken, if you could start us off on this one. Um, so that's them reflecting on their science. But how, how can science fiction be used to create a self-reflexive capacity in scientists, do you think? 
Well, my own my own background is kind of being a somebody who almost made it as a scientist <laughs> and 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 didn't and. One of the things I found on, along the way, I don't know if it's still true, was that very few scientists really read science fiction. And the, the first people I met were, the first workplace I was ever in where most people read science fiction was in fact in, a, in an IT department. IT departments are full of failed scientists, full of science fiction readers. Is this a coincidence? I don't know. I doubt it. The, the use However, I, I do think there is a way that science fiction can <coughs> indirectly promote um, reflection among scientists, and that is by using it as a, a catalyst for discussion, so precisely this kind of discussion, in fact. The image of scientists in science fiction varies a great deal and apart from the science fiction, apart from lab lit, which is not quite science fiction, and the science fiction that's written by actual scientists, the scientist in science fiction isn't particularly, isn't always necessarily particularly accurate. You can always tell the science fiction that's written by people who have been, have been or still are scientists. People like Paul Macaulay, people like um, Greg Benford, um, I remember a, a review of a Greg Benford book many years ago in New Science where it said, yes, he gets the scientists right, always fudging details and cadging for grants. And so, so true. But uh, another person who, um, another writer who is a science fiction writer who has been a scientist is in fact Pippa herself. And one of the things that I learned from reading Pippa's uh, first novel the falling sky, is the ferocious criticism that goes on within science. The, the moment when you present a paper or present a poster and, you know, your colleagues pounce on it like uh, hyenas. That was something that as a postgrad student I had never quite experienced and never quite seen the, the full force of. So, I think that because A, science fiction is not necessarily terribly accurate about scientists, and B, scientists aren't necessarily terribly interested in science fiction because they get their non-human kick from their work rather than from their, their reading. It has to be indirect. And one of the ways in which um, we found, Pippa and I found, that it, it could work indirectly in stimulating um, self-reflexive discussion and awareness among scientists was precisely to use it as a social tool. Because science fiction fandom, contrary to um, a widespread prejudice, is actually very sociable. Most science fiction fans are very talkative, have lots of friends, and if you want to start a discussion in a city or a town somewhere, this is a free tip, about a science, about a science topic you can use the science fiction community as a great trawl to haul in a whole net of the, the wider public. And often for scientists, um, can, you know, having a chance to explain themselves to people who are fascinated is a big step forward. We found in Pippa and I and others who were working on at the Genomics Forum found that if you set up a science fiction writer and a scientist and a social scientist and got them all talking, you could get, you could fill almost any venue you could hire with, with people, especially if you included free drinks. So I think to sum up, socially very effective um, in terms of literary effect, perhaps not so much. Okay. Um, so J Jennifer's saying she's not sure she agrees. So maybe do you want to? <laughs> I think there's maybe there's no direct. Well, first of all, I'm a scientist and I love science fiction, as well as lots of other art and literature. And, and, despite what people might think, scientists are very interested in a lot of things, not just science. But I agree with you that perhaps if you're trying to channel get your message directly to scientists, scientists science fiction might not be the best thing. But actually, scientists aren't really getting their brief from 
from that, perhaps. But what could give them the brief is how society reacts to a piece of art. So say there's a blockbuster film about climate change, and it makes a lot of people really worried about it. That could actually indirectly affect um, what gets funded. So if, if people get really upset about climate change and they say, oh, God, we're not doing enough, maybe we can increase the funding for, for climate change science. And then the science will indirectly reap the benefits from, from this sort of um, indirect method. I think actually a really scary science fiction scenario could wake people up to maybe get a bit more politically active or to, to lobby the government for, to divert funds from this to that. I, I really think that could happen. And I think maybe novels, not so much, but I think the blockbuster films, because uh, yeah. I think science fiction readers, there's a, there's a little bit of a demographic I don't want to insult anyone. It tends to, whenever I go to the science fiction the, the, section, these are them. Well, there tends to be a lot of men, maybe not so many women, just as a broad generalization. But a blockbuster Hollywood film attracts loads of people. And those who aren't, you're not preaching to the converted there, they're just going to see a film. They're maybe not interested in science, but they might see the message. You might reach millions and millions of people with one great film. So I think yeah. if we expand the definition to, to Hollywood, I think it could be very powerful. I'm sure there's examples of that happening, but I, I don't know any off the top of my head. I'm also wondering about childhood, because I, I'm sure I read somewhere, and I'm not a scholar, as is painfully evident, but I'm sure I read a piece of research that deeply impressed the Chinese, um, that there was some survey of scientists and what they read as children, and as children, they read a lot of fantasy and science fiction, and as children, they tended to read more of it than even the average uh, reader. And the, the Chinese were very impressed by that correlation between reading science fiction when you're young and becoming a scientist, or an innovator, at least. And the Chinese, uh, uh, I am told, by some Chinese visitors we had at the University of Manchester, that they were very interested in that, and that was partly behind some of the interest, real interest and real approval. You know, this vast, powerful, burgeoning, country that we all know is going to be the number one country in the world, you know, if not next decade in, in our life, and well, not my life team time, but yours possibly. Uh, is, and they are very, very strongly behind science fiction. And I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect there. Um, and I certainly remember, it seems to me, when I was in high school, the only other guys who, there was me, who uh, was a fantasy person, really, you know, I came in via Peter Pan and the Wizard of Oz. But there were a whole bunch of guys who came into it because they were geeks. And they, 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 they read Analog and I read Amazing. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, I'm sure we could carry on, <laughs> on on this topic, but sort of just a little bit conscious of time. So I'm just going to pick up on on something which is which is related, I think, and sort of moves, moves it on a bit, which is... Um, uh, and this is really for, for Jennifer, if you want to sort of pick up on this one, the ability of fiction to augment or uh, to, to help the ability to storytell about the actual research. Yeah, I think that I, I'm quite against the idea of books, novels or films being pedagogical. So I, I, don't, I don't think that a story is, is to educate. But... Any novel about any topic, if it's a good novel, will teach the reader something, not teach, but imbue the reader with new knowledge, whether it be science or art or uh, Moby Dick, how to kill a whale. Mm. It's all sorts of uh, procedure involved in court cases, um, how detectives do their jobs. Novels are excellent at imbuing people with new knowledge. I, I wouldn't want to be the author of a novel that was trying to educate people about science. There are some authors that feel that's, that's, that's the job of a science novel. I'm not one of those people. But I do recognize the power of fiction to, to, to gently and by stealth pass on some interesting ideas. But I think it's not just that the facts and figures that can be imbued. It's, it's the process. And if you just take one example, which is that most people don't realize what you were saying, that scientists are always fighting amongst each other. And knowledge is not this line from A to B. It's a rugby scrum. We believe this. We don't believe this. We believe this. We don't believe this. And slowly moving forward towards some sort of truth with a capital T that really isn't truth. It's just a messy approximation of reality. And mo people don't understand that. So when they see two scientists on television disagreeing with each other about climate change or how it works, 
They say, oh my God, the scientists don't even agree with yeah. this. So how can we trust in climate change is, is man-made? If these two scientists can't even agree, people don't understand that the process of science is exactly that. It's a back and forth scrum. It's dissing your colleagues at conferences. It's coming to some sort of consensus by argumentation and skepticism. So we're all very skeptical people. And obviously, if we do this in public, it makes people nervous because they think, oh, these scientists, they're not so sure of their position. And if, if a novel could show, like Pippa is great at this, her novel, The Falling Sky, was great for showing that this is how science really works. And if more people understood that this is how science works, they would understand that it's gray and, and it's not black and white. So I think yeah, be, no, I, I, I agree. I think it's always, it's always quite sad when people want, what is the answer? Tell us the answer, scientists, without as you say, understanding that this is, maybe we don't know, it might be this, it might be that, probably this, and um, as you say that, if that undermines confidence, that's, yeah. that's, that's very sad, really. Um, I don't know, uh, Jeff or Ken, do you, do you want to follow on at all? From Just as a, a little aphorism, I mean, most people want faith and science does give them doubt, and that's what they don't understand. The scientific method is applied doubt, and they, they don't get that. They really don't get it, and nor do they want it. Yeah, and just just taking up a, a point that Jennifer made about consensus, that's another widely misunderstood concept in, the, in the relation particularly to climate science, because you see a lot, well, if you, if you hang about in the disreputable parts of the internet like I do for professional reasons, you see an awful lot of um, people deriding the idea of scientific consensus as if it was like an imposed party line or a religious dogma. And in fact, when there is a scientific consensus or a near consensus on something, you can be very sure that it's the outcome of this ferocious, uh, mutual, clawing criticism. So it's a very strong thing indeed. It, it's not like, you know, there is a, a pope of climate science somewhere who, who lays, lays down the law and everybody follows it, by no means. Okay. So... I think so. Uh, just thinking about the sort of next thing to to to, to talk about. I think so. Uh, all that has you know has been about how do we, what does fiction do? How does that work with science uh, and all the rest of it? And so certainly through this this project, I've been really struck by how 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 different it has been on each occasion with different scientists. Uh, to work alongside them, uh, partly in how they describe their science, but particularly when they're engaging in the process of that sort of birthing of a piece of fiction. So one of the things we've done throughout is uh, send the, not the final story, but you know, a, a well almost completed version to the scientists to say, can you check the science in this? You know, is this, uh, is this completely bonkers? Um, and uh, we probably will end up sitting on the same stage at some point where you're able to criticize uh, uh, what's in my story. So let's, let's do that uh, beforehand. But what I've been really interested in that is, as I say, the different reactions. And, and, and some of those have been more concerned about how the scientists in the stories have been portrayed. And it, a, a young female scientist would never behave like that. Some have been very interested in the, the really technical details uh, in, in the science. So it's, it's, it's just, in, to me, that's, that's quite interesting. And I'm, I sp so this is me working round to a question, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, uh, probably for Jeff to, to go first as, he's, uh, as he hasn't yet. Um, I'm just wondering, so in, the, in those sort of collaborations between um, sort of arts, humanities, social sciences and uh, hard sciences, engineering, in that, in that sort of whole world of collaboration. Um, how, how do you think that those collaborations can be really fostered? And, and importantly, how can they enable the sort of creativity to, to blossom? I, I actually think that it's something scientists have to learn how to do. Um, first off, uh, my main experience with uh, when it changed was how kind of scared most of the scientists were. They, first off, they thought, well, am I, am I, what, what's happening? Am I actually writing the story? And you actually had to begin to imagine for them step by step what a collaboration might consist of. And in the end, you were left saying, well, look, what you do is you just read the story then, and, and if it goes wrong, 
don't say that would never happen. We can say that would never happen. But then, then ask them, well, what are you needing in the story? Why does that happen in the story? And you can begin to offer them an alternative from your knowledge. And that happened with my collaboration. The, I needed to, the story was they find these little things on Mars and they might be cultural artifacts or they might just be worm shit. They're not sure. And we put them through a, a, a particle accelerator to, to see what, what kind of material they are. And this guy, and he, 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 he was very dubious about the whole thing. And suddenly he said, well, but by then, you know, we're making, you'll have portable cyclotrons then. And so, wow, portable <laughs> cyclotrons on Mars. Um, but it is not something that um, comes naturally to a lot of scientists. There were some who were really, really enthusiastic. There were some who said, yay, yes, please. And then halfway through the process just said, I can't do that and fled. And you had to then try and find another scientist for the same story. Um, so I don't think it's something that, that comes naturally. We were talking earlier about what they do in America, um, which is the, I can never remember the initials, the Advancement of Science Association. Yeah, Triple A, yes. They've got this marvelous program, which is pretty well funded, has, again, raising funds all the time. Basically, they make it free to film and TV producers to have, and they have a pool of scientists that they do train that are available for this kind of work to uh, consult. So they consult on the Big Bang Theory. They consult on it, and they give them training, and they say, you're not going for scientific accuracy. You're going for scientific authenticity, which is that it feels real. It feels like that might be the process. It feels like a, you know, it's not Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde alone in his lab with his bubbling pots and pans making magic potions. It's a, a much more uh, convincing kind of thing. And uh, be prepared for them to say we can't do that in storytelling terms, improvise. Um, I thank you very much, Jenna, for that, that point about fiction not being pedagogical. I think this is, it's something that science fiction often does to try and raise funds or get things together. It's sort of, you know, we'll encourage science, we'll encourage development, we'll communicate about science. But I don't think fiction is actually for that. Um, I'm not sure what it is for. Um, in this story, what was really interesting to me was the kind of implications that um, bacteria or fungus or disease could have neurological effects and alter behavior at first in these very simple organisms. Now, the collaborator on this story was that wonderful lab assistant we met. What was her name? Uh, I sent her the story, and Susie, Susie, Sinzi, Sinzi, that's why I can't remember Sinzi. Yes, she's fabulous. Now, the whole point of the story was that what had happened is Todd has been taken over by the fungus and is somehow or another is behaving in ways that is encouraging the reproduction of the fungus. And that was the bit of the story that said, well, this is just crazy. I mean, it isn't happening. It's just a bad idea that this overworked kind of bullshy woman lab as a manager uh, has, but it's not there in real, for real. And it was Cindy who says, I think I should show you an article in Nature. And I mean, the implications of that cat research are far beyond that. Um, the infection rate in England is about 10%. In Germany, it's 80%. And they actually think there might be correlated to differences in driving style. But the, the, the really weird thing was that as far as they could tell, based on physical sex, that the parasite makes men very disrespectful risk-taking, they start doing things like bungee diving, or it makes women, apparently, on a bell-shaped curve, more affectionate and more likely to hug the cats. And at that point, the, the philosophical implications become so bizarre that you, you know, you're, you're left with something that, you know, basically you say, we need further research on this, don't we? And, you know, can we make sure that the measuring team is all women this time? Um, but, I, you know, it's the philosophical implications sometimes of this stuff, as well as the sense of wonder, as well as that emotional frisson the stories give us that are the source of their pleasure. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think there's, there's a use to this story I wrote. I mean, Yours, yeah. You know, we're going to watch out those NHS health bots. But, um. Well, I'm just so given, given where we are time-wise, I think it's probably, we'll open up to, 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 to you guys to ask 
questions or or make make comments. You might think there is a, a, a point to uh, to Jeff's story, other than to scare us to death. Um, so, yeah. Any who, who would anybody like to ask a question? Yes, there's one. Are you miking? Yeah, brilliant. And we'll just do one at a time. I know it's good practice to do three, but I can never remember three things. So. I'm just curious as to, well, I don't, I don't want to get into genres here, but this, we've been, the discussion's been focusing on science fiction. And I'm curious as to whether or not you have views on sort of more mainstream fiction people dealing with science. I can think of Richard Powers, for example, who his last half dozen books, each one's dealt with a specific science theme. Uh, or implication. I learned a whole lot about forestry from this most recent one that I, you know, I wouldn't go read in a textbook. So it's, you know, it's out there. I don't know how pervasive it is, and I'm just sort of curious as to your views on how successful those kinds of attempts are. The, the guy who was going to be here, Simon Ings, I would say writes much more um, on, on books that you, the, the, you sort of keep thinking they're going to become science fiction and never do quite. His first book was called Weight of Numbers, now probably f at least 10 years ago, if not 15. And he was already looking at uh, data mining and the, the, you know, how so much information was being collected about us that basically we had a kind of numerical immortality and that we were becoming en masse very predictable. And it wasn't science fiction at all. He, he then followed up with a, a, a really quite amazing book that was nonfiction about science under Stalin and the intersection of sociological and political forces with how science is done. You know, really interesting book. And his new novel is apparently somewhat similar, and I haven't wrote it, but he would have been able to talk to that really easily. Yeah, Jennifer? It's like I run a, la uh, a website called lablit.com, which is attempting to, to collect every mainstream novel ever written that has scientists as central characters. Richard Powers is on that list. He's written Galatea 2.2. Um, he's written at least five what I would call lablet novels. There are a lot of examples of it uh, recently. It's very rare, though. So we've been, for 13 years, have been seeking nominations and searching through old bookshelves and libraries. We've collected 240 novels ever written that have scientists as central characters. They're sort of a mainstream, not science fiction. So very, very few of them. I call it lablet. It's not really a genre, because you can't have a genre with 240 books. But <laughs> it's a good thought experiment to think about. Why aren't there more scientists in normal novels? There are, sci there are novels about writers and artists and people who work in shops and detectives and doctors. But 240 novels about a profession that is so central to our modern life. Well, I find it's not about scientists, but just about as, that's also interesting, yeah. yeah. It's very, very rare, and apparently it's rare because editors, the, the, the literary gateway, publishers and editors and agents, they're all humanities people, and they've been avoiding science all their lives. <laughs> and when they see, this is actually true, when they see a book about science, they say, science, oh, we don't like science. Uh, nobody's going to read that. Slush pile. So I think that with the advent of publishing on demand and self-publishing, maybe we'll get more science into novels. We've got... A question here, and then a question here. So, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and and uh, trying to figure figure this out for myself. And and um, uh, it's I, I answer this question, and I think that one of the problems, one of the reasons that the 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 the, 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 the literary editors react like that is comes out in uh, is because science fiction tends to fall into this genre category too quickly and and the pedagogic pedagogical aspect is one of one of those reasons because as soon as a book becomes pedagogical it tends to become genre and actually its literary quality goes down and the other one is you touched on as well but which I, I actually put in the same category is that often it's it's seen that the, the novels about science need to carry some kind of message and when you talked about hollywood movies you know and that actually i think that's the same thing is the the pedagogy and, and I think that as soon as a book tries to carry a message, a literary editor will reject it. Because literary writing and the highest quality isn't, isn't about a message. It's not trying to push a line. You know, it's, it's examining human behavior and examining human psychology. And, and it's really interesting. I mean, I know Simon well, and um, 
and and, and I think you know he uh, you know is is a really interesting example because he's trying to write um, books which are science fiction without the hyphen, as it were. And 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 um, Simon Ings, yeah. Um, and and I, and I think this is very interesting thing to do. And I think Richard Powers is, is exactly in this in this strain too. And, and the reasons his novels are literary is that he they both do that thing, which Ken pointed out that lovely Asimov quote, which is so correct. When you're writing about science, you need to write through the science to the projected human behaviour that's on the other side of it. So you must think about the talk radio that comes from the cars, and you've got to write about that. If you write about that, which is no, I mean, someone mentioned The Handmaid's Tale. That's exactly what happens in The Handmaid's Tale. She writes through the science, or through the, through the scenario, to really just examine the behavior. And then, it becomes a, then there becomes a universality to it. And too often, people who write science fiction or books about science do not do that. And so they, the literary quality goes down. And I think that's, it's easy to diss the literary editors saying, oh, they're scared of science. I don't think that's right. I think they're very good at spotting when the point of the literary fiction does not arrive in the end product because the science gets too foregrounded and actually the message gets too strong and, and you miss the main point of a novel, which is the emotional response, which is, I think, exactly why it's so interesting what you said about and the scientists themselves don't get that because they see what needs to be delivered as science as accuracy, but what needs to be delivered is scientific authenticity. Um, and, and it's that leap that I think is very difficult when people are writing about science because they get, simply get too tied up in the fact. And what you want is the emotional and the, and the universality, which is really, really difficult to get to. I, I think there's so many books that do that, and they, 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 they don't... I think there's so many science fiction novels that get to the human story, and they somehow don't cross that barrier perhaps because they are sold as genre. As a science fiction writer, I'm kind of feeling that a lot of the time my sensation as a science fiction writer is that my territory has been trumped, if that's the right word, uh, currently, um, by literary fiction because they, I, uh, more and more it seems to me writers are, uh, literary writers are very interested in science. They realize it's to be written about. And I'm thinking all the way back to Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood, which was very much a realistic novel with so much science in it. And people like uh, uh, Toby Litt write novels which are full of science and bounce, or even if they're only using scientific um, uh, in information or, or, or discoveries as a metaphor for other things. Um, so I, you know, I'm very pleased, there's 240. I mean, there's Thanks. a lot. So. I'm sure this will carry on at, at, at the bar, this particular conversation. Um, but we had a, just to sort of move us on, just conscious we've got probably time for a couple more questions. So we've got a question here, and then whoever's next will be the last, probably. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your um, fascinating stories. And um, the answer is probably 42 in... <laughs> to put in that but um i'm really curious about well for a start where science stops and technology begins and there's a big move with stem to make it into steam to add arts in with science technology engineering and mathematics and I'm just curious, like, we just had the literary fiction versus genre debate. Maybe these boundaries are an absolute luxury. Uh, you know, I, I'm like Paul Macaulay in Austral said, um, his lovely character, Austral, I'm interested in the future because it's where I'm going to live. In a way, perhaps we're not thinking, well, my question to you is, in the future, are these strange divisions we're making now going to seem a peculiar aberration, just like in Renaissance times? What, what do you think? Ken, do you? Oh, these are, these are very good questions. I, I think myself that um, having kind of suffered through education and all that, and being one of those kids 
who were inspired by science fiction to go into science, but who was entirely the wrong kind of kid, because I was really an arts person at heart. Um, I, I think there is, a, there is a difference in the mentality, the psychology, the kind of rigor and the kind of discipline required to do well in, in the arts than to do well in the, uh, in the natural sciences, the mathematic, mathematics and so forth. And I don't think it serves any useful purpose to add the A to STEM and make it STEAM. <laughs> I think that's vaporware, frankly. Um, we, but, and, and kind of linked to that is why, why does this distinction between s mainstream fiction and science fiction arise in the first place? And I think it arises simply because there is this huge aspect of the, this huge universe that science has discovered, this nature outside of human concerns that is dealt with nowhere else in, in literature or in art. And as long as that need is unsatisfied by literature, by mainstream literature, there will be a demand for science fiction among people who are gobsmacked by the night sky and so on. I, I, I've done 100 interviews with African science fiction writers, and um, one, and they each take three days to transcribe. Don't do this. Never do something like that. Just get a sound recorder and stick them online as, as files. But um, what I'm seeing in a lot of cases, and I'm hearing over and over in East Africa, West Africa, um, first off, the writers themselves don't recognize a genre. They, they, they just seem to naturally write these stories that have magic or science fiction ideas sometimes, and other times they're writing a story about their parents' divorce. And these kinds of divisions until very recently, until there was a certain strand of jealousy coming in, had no sway in African thinking. I mean, the, uh, the big literary festivals like the AK Literary Festival, they don't see any difference between a science fiction writer or anybody else. The big guests is Nedia Korafor. You know, it's not something that they, they, they make a big deal. I've also noticed that African artists tend to paint, tend to write, tend to do poetry, tend to make film, and work as a psychologist during the day. They're, they're, they're very more mixed media than we are. Um, and what they'll say is, eh, you know, we go in, in the morning, we go to Roman Catholic religious education and it's Garden of Eden. And then in the afternoon, eh, it's all big bang and quantum mechanics. And then we go home, and then we worship at the family shrine. Only we don't tell the pastor. And why make a big deal? That just they all float together. And you keep hearing this a, a lot, and you start asking them about the difference between science fiction and fantasy and literature. And one of them goes very quiet and says, you know, I think your writing is about contradictions and resolving them, and I think our writing is about overlap. And I, at times, I think, that we're dealing with cultures where what we think of as the classical dialectic really isn't how people think. That there's a diff something else going on there. It's not th thesis, antithesis, have a big long argument, tear each other to shreds, and then we have a new consensus. I'm not sure that that works. So it's very interesting to briefly, as a science fiction person, except in South Africa, where of course it's that times 40. The literary Publishers have big things on their website saying we do not accept any submissions of science fiction or fantasy. And the mainstream, the white, always white, mainstream writers will take you to one side and say, these blood, we have these fabulous writers in South Africa. Nobody cares about them. The only people who are getting any listening at all are science fiction writers. And you know, they're the only people that anybody cares about. And the science fiction writers who are white will say, it's these bloody literary people. They won't let you get a word in edgewise. And there you get the divisions. And I'll leave it to you to judge the different histories that may lay behind that. So I'm going to change my mind about um, another question. Uh, however, one more. Do you want one? Yeah. Are, we, are we up for one, one more? Okay, a, 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 one more, one more, and then then we'll then we'll finish. So, yeah, okay. Hi, uh, it's a very quick question. Um, I was just thinking, like, you know, with these collaborations between science fiction writers and scientists, where can you find opportunities like this? Because it's something that I'd be really interested in doing. So, 
Excellent. You have to know Christine is my answer. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question to, to, to end, actually. And we've probably all got different experiences of that. So should we sort of quickly go along and say, say what our answer is? Starting with Jeff. Apply for a grant or talk to Comma Press because they regularly publish anthologies of stories that kind of do that. So if you're a writer, you have a way in, and maybe as a scientist too. Well, I got into this through Jeff, so you know, <laughs> it's all who, that's how small it is. I was going to mention Comma Press as well. Yeah, go talk to Raj, the Ra, Ra, Ra page. Oh, Ra. Come, yeah, yeah. he'll set you up. Which side are you coming from, by the way? You're writer? Uh, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I think what I've found is uh, it sort of snowballs. Uh, one thing leads to another, leads to another. Let people know that you're interested and who knows? So, so one of the things we do at Virtual Futures is we run a near future fiction thing, which I think you're aware of. So, you know, submitting things to that gets you to meet, etc. I mean, I happen to know that you're very good at <laughs> connecting with people, but just as a general sort of comment. Um, okay, so that's, that's it. We're just going to do some thank yous and, and some sort of goodbyes. So uh, big thank you to Christine and King's College for being with this right from, right from the beginning. Bravo. Uh, and obviously to Jeff, Ken, Jennifer, to Gigi and to Pippa, who isn't here, for their, all their stories and wisdom. Thank you. That's right. That's the way it goes. <laughs> um, thank you for your uh, questions, and uh, I hope you found I hope you found it interesting. Just going to hand back to Tom, who's going to wind uh, wind the evening up, and then we can people buy those books if they want. So books by most. Okay, most of them. If there's a book there you can't buy. Which one? I don't know which one. I can sell it. Okay, yeah. so can't you can buy it. all of them unless they're Jennifer's. You buy them through Waterstones. If they're Jennifer's, you buy them from Jennifer. Um, okay, so I shall hand over or hand back to Tom. All right, pretty face Spielman is back. Um, yeah, a few more thank yous just to wind up. Waterstones, Tottenham Court Road for giving us a space to yeah, play. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <Look it. laughs> King's College London, as Christine has already said. Yeah. <laughs> to, <laughs> to Benjamin Greenaway, our technical rock back there. <laughs> to David, our sound man, who is also back there. And then um, if you like what we do, check out our website at virtualfutures.co.uk. It's not just stuff like this. We also do near future fictions events. We do salon events. We do in conversations with. There's a whole plethora of stuff up there. It's great. Um, support us on Patreon and find out what we're up to on Twitter at Virtual Futures. And I just want to end with this, our usual outro. The future is always virtual, and some things that may seem imminent or, inev or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, though, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. However, it is imperative that we continue to stare the future deep into the eyes and continue to and challenge everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel Ooh. that you've done that tonight. Please join me in thanking these incredible panelists once more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <enough. laughs>